everyone, welcome back to the Spirit of Success. I'm your host, Yara, and on today's episode, we will be discussing careers related to business, entrepreneurship, and film. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with well-known and highly regarded businessman, entrepreneur, CEO, executive producer, and philanthropist, Mr. Steve Sarowitz. Mr. Sarowitz is the founder and chairman of the payroll and HR company, Paylocity, the founder and executive producer of Spring Green Films, and partner with Justin Baldoni in Wayfarer Studios, which creates films that uplift people's spirits and promotes unity and justice through their work. Throughout all his work, Mr. Sarowitz continues to express his passion for service to humanity. Welcome, Mr. Sarowitz. How are you today? I'm doing great, Yara. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. And thank you for being on the show. I'm super excited for our conversation. So before we get into the details of your career, we would love to know what got you into business, entrepreneurship and film, and how did you get your start in each? Um, so business, I was in college years ago and my friend asked me to go to the entrepreneurs club and I didn't really know what an entrepreneur was. I couldn't spell it, but, and I was a pretty uh, lackluster student. I wasn't a great student. And uh, we went to this club. I thought, wow, okay, I like this club. And I stayed in the club, but I really found my passion there. Um, it was really an interesting subject to me. It seemed very creative. And I've always been kind of a creative person. And very shortly thereafter, as I stayed in the club, um, I ended up thinking this really matches my personality. So I started my first business uh, a couple months later, a painting business. And I've been doing businesses on and off ever since then, mostly on for most of my adult life. And my first business, my first major business after the painting business was a Chinese restaurant. So I um, started a Chinese restaurant when I was only 25 years old. How cool. And what got you into film? Well, that's a longer story. So after that, I got into the payroll business and I did that for many years and I'm still in the payroll business. And in 2015, I declared as a Baha'i. Three days after I declared as a Baha'i, my friend said to me, I, I told him I didn't need money anymore. I'd done very well in the payroll business. And he was in the payroll business. He's a Baha'i. And my friend Farshid said to me, well, you can reach hundreds of people. I told him I wanted to just retire and teach the Baha'i faith. He said, you can reach hundreds of people if you do that. But if you make a movie, you can reach millions of people. And less than an hour later, I got an email from a movie producer by the name of Peter Samuelson. And Peter had made 25 films, the most popular of which you probably haven't heard of, but your parents might have heard of called Revenge of the Nerds. And uh, that got me started on making uh, on a three year odyssey, which ended up being the making of The Gate, The Dawn of the Baha'i Faith. And that got me into the movie business. Along the way, I met the great Justin Baldoni. I met Rain Wilson. Um, Rain Wilson actually appeared in my film, In the Gate. And uh, Justin Baldoni gave me some advice about The Gate. And along the way, he said, hey, I'm looking to raise some money for my business. And I went back to him and I said, you know, Justin, that's great, but I'd like to be your partner. You don't have to raise money. I'm willing to give it. And then he asked me a lot of questions and made sure I was worthy to be his partner. And luckily, I passed. Wow, how amazing. And we'll be talking a little bit more about The Gate. Um, as we go along this interview, so you, you will all find out more about that movie and Mr. Sarah's experience. But uh, speaking more on the uh, part of your career that is related to business and entrepreneurship, um, at Paylocity, your company focuses and places great value on promoting and fostering the ideas of equality, the oneness of humanity, working together, and the culture of care. Can you please tell us more about what Paylocity does and how these values and the mission of your company have been influenced by your own values and beliefs? Well, Paylocity is a provider, one of the nation's leading providers now publicly held of HR and payroll solutions. And I think that in business, you always try to do the same thing, which is try to do the best thing you can uh, for your customers, for your employees. I always said happy employees, happy clients. And I instilled that throughout my company. And I think that's very much in keeping with my faith. It's a, it's a matter of service. You're servicing your clients and you do it honestly. Um, one of the sayings in the Baha'i faith, one of, the, uh, one of the teachings is, truthfulness is the foundation of all virtues, of all human virtues. And so for me, as part of running a business, you do it very truthfully. If you say you're going to do something, you do it. And so I always tried to run my business honestly. I tried to treat my employees well. And I think because of that, that helped me be successful and that helped the company 
be successful. So I think it's helped the company grow uh, from a startup with nothing to now uh, we have over 3,000 employees. Uh, Steve Beauchamp, who's the CEO and is my friend, and I hired him all the way back in 2007. He um, has done a great job running the company. Um, I think both of us share this value in the oneness of humanity. Steve is very much a person who believes that all people deserve a chance. Uh, we are actually actively trying to make the company more diverse together. Steve is doing, of course, all the heavy lifting, but I am a big fan. I, I usually say my, my job at Velocity is to watch Steve work and then the management team there and just to cheer him on and support him. Uh, but I was very proud of him. Uh, he's really pushed um, very hard to diversify our board. He's pushing hard to diversify our, our top management team. And this is what I really want to tell fellow entrepreneurs and people who want to be entrepreneurs and people who want to be in business is diversity helps you always. Now, if you're just checking the box and I say, I want a black person or a brown person or a woman, and you're not actually looking for qualifications, okay, it could hurt you. But if you do nothing else but hire the most qualified, diverse candidate every time for a job, your company will be stronger because you're going to have different points of view. And it it's proven that more diverse companies, companies that are looking really actively to be more equitable, actually do better. Companies that are more ethical do better. Similarly, how have your beliefs and values influenced your approach to filmmaking? Well, I got into filmmaking because of my beliefs and values. Uh, first of all, I wanted to do something uh, to the Baha'i faith. I, I really love this newfound faith of mine. I became a Baha'i six years ago. And so I wanted to contribute to the faith and of course, as I mentioned before, it was suggested that I make a film. Going further, I think what the films do is they touch people's hearts. So if you look at what I do with Justin and what Justin is particularly adept at doing is he's really good at reaching people in their hearts. The movie we made, Clouds, with about the story of Zach Sobiak, um, people just have told me over and over again that that movie made them cry. And so the idea with getting into films is I could try to teach people about the oneness of humanity and I can tell them in words, but you can show them and they say a picture is worth, worth a thousand words. And I really think that that's true of film as well. And so our goal is to make films that teach that we're one human family, that break apart the age old prejudices like racism and sexism and nationalism and religious prejudice. We have a TV show, for example, called Little Mosque on the Prairie, which was actually developed by Baha'is in Canada, which we've licensed to uh, remake in the United States. And uh, we're really looking forward to that. And that hopefully will help with combating Islamophobia. How important and what a needed message and what a wonderful way to help increase representation of all to make films and movies that really reflect the world that we live in um, and the people that live in our world. Along with your work at Paylocity, and as we've been talking about a little bit, uh, you also founded the media company Spring Green Films. Um, and as part of that company, you made the well-known film, The Gate, Dawn of the Baha'i Faith. Um, can you share a little bit more with our audience about what that film is about and your experience working on it? Well, if you look right behind me, there's this beautiful building that's called the Shrine of the Bob. That's where the Bob is buried. And the Bob, when you translate it into English, literally means the gate. So the, the, the gate is the story of the Bob. It's a documentary on his life. I watched the movie. Um, everyone, you should be sure to check it out. We're going to talk a little bit about it towards the end where you can find it. Um, but it's beautiful. And I know towards the end, there's um, a little bit showing like the experience of filming the movie and everything like that. The movie actually was filmed in Spain, no? Yes, we filmed uh, the reenactment scenes in Spain. And uh, we filmed the interviews in London, Chicago and L.A. Um, so we, we did a lot of filming in different places and we filmed the narration right here, right behind me at the Shrine of the Bob. And it was just amazing. It was an amazingly emotional time. Um, we're grateful that the House of Justice let us do filming here. Again, that was one of those times where I said, I'm in heaven. You know, I'm just happy doing this. It's not, you know, there's nothing on earth I'd rather be doing than doing this movie right now filming at the sh I mean, you almost had to pinch yourself when you woke, woke up in the morning and said, am I really filming a movie? Um, that joy that the whole crew felt. And by the way, most of the crew was not Baha'i. But the, it was incredible joy. And there were tears when we were filming the last scene. It was very emotional filming this movie. The Bob.
Bob was a revolutionary prophet. His life was marked by drama and intrigue and tens of thousands of people following him. The Bob, I think, is someone who is engaging in intimacy and ecstasy with the divine at a very deep level. People fell under his influence to the point of being willing to sacrifice his life for him and his ideas. Someone with that sort of influence over the masses of people was perceived as a threat. It was politically disruptive to have a new religion appear. You have to execute him. 750 soldiers shot. And when the smoke cleared, the Bob had vanished. All major religions have prophecies of a promised one who will usher in a golden age. The Messiah, the return of Christ, the 10th Avatar, and the 12th Imam. Today, many have put aside these prophecies, never imagining that they could come true, especially in their own lifetime. But this was not always so. Less than 200 years ago, People all over the world experienced an intense and immediate expectation of a promised one. Major world religions, such as Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, were each independently identifying the same time period, the mid-19th century, for the appearance of their promised one. In England, France, Germany, Holland, Sweden, and other countries, Christians were actively waiting to receive the fulfillment of prophecies that they were convinced were imminent. In the early 19th century, uh, especially for Protestants in America, there was a lot of religious fervor. Revivals were being preached in churches, out in the fields. And in these revivals, people were hearing that Jesus Christ would return again and that the world would be purified by fire. At that time, a man named William Miller became convinced that the second coming, or second advent of Jesus Christ, could be calculated to the day and set out to prove it. William Miller went through the Bible meticulously and he matched historic events that had already happened with prophecies in the, both the Old and the New Testaments. And to his great surprise, he discovered, first of all, the first advent was there, prophesied in the Old Testament, and then that the second advent was coming. He compared the prophecies with actual historical events uh, that seemed to fulfill prophetic uh, promises and computed very rationally the date when all the prophecies would be fulfilled. Thousands of people believed that Miller was right and flocked to what became the American Adventist movement convinced that Jesus Christ would return on a specific day in 1844. One can imagine the heightened expectation of people, both the excitement and the fear of what was coming. The farmers stopped farming their fields. They didn't do the harvest. Some people uh, confessed to crimes so that they wouldn't have the crimes on their conscience when Jesus came. People who drank gave up alcohol. People really changed the way of living, ready for this fantastic moment. On October 22nd, 1844, 100,000 followers gathered together in churches, homes, and fields in anticipation of the promised arrival of Jesus Christ. Well, when the sun came up on October 23rd, they had to confess to themselves that nothing happened. It was terrible. It was really terrible. They were completely distraught and weeping. The day became known around the world as the Great Disappointment. What I find fascinating is that a similar thing was happening in Persia amongst the Shia Muslims. And extraordinarily enough, the year that they were looking at in their calendar was 1260, 
which is 1844 in our calendar. While Christians in the West were awaiting the return of Christ in 1844, at the same time in the East, Shia Muslims also awaited a divine messenger under a different name, the 12th Imam. They believe that he was in a state of physical concealment. He was alive and present, but he simply could not be seen. They imagined that this thousand-year-old person would return to the world as an agent of God to bring peace that he would use the sword to become a political leader and rule over the world with justice. Every Shi'i in mid-19th century Iran, of course, had to believe this. Some of them perhaps hoped it would never happen because it would be a great shakeup, according to the prophecies in, in the Shi'i holy books. Things would be turned upside down. It wouldn't be business as usual when the hidden imam comes back. Yes, justice would be established, but uh, many things would change. The Orthodox religious and political leaders of Persia, while they paid lip service to the longed-for advent of the 12th Imam, they well knew that his arrival would signal the end of their power. On the one hand, they have to constantly show reverence towards the 12th Imam. On the other hand, any person, any movement, which in any form or shape makes a claim of being that millenarian realization, they would fight it with all their power and might. One of the Shia Muslims who had been waiting for the 12th Imam in the years before 1844 was a religious scholar named Sheikh Ahmad. He led an independent movement of followers known as the Sheikhis in Persia and Iraq. Sheikh Ahmad gathered around himself students and disciples to prepare the people for the appearance of the Promised One. The growing Sheikhi movement was a direct threat to the traditional clerics. Despite being persecuted, the Sheikhi's innovative and original teachings continued to attract followers. One of these followers was a brilliant scholar named Sayed Kazem. He succeeded Sheikh Ahmad and greatly advanced the movement in Karbala. But Sayed Kazem died without naming a successor. Prior to his passing, Sayyid Qasim urged his students to do nothing but to scatter in search of the Promised One, whose appearance was imminent. Another Sheikhi of great significance was a religious cleric named Mullah Hussein. He returned from a special mission to find that Sayyid Qasim had passed. Mullah Hussein returned to Karbala and he inquired as to what Sayyid Qasim's final instructions had been to them. What were his last wishes? And to his amazement, he heard that Sayyid Qasim had stated very clearly to them that upon his passing, they were to do nothing but to scatter in search of the Promised One. Why are you still here? In anger, he turned to his fellow Sheikhis, imploring them to do as Sayyid Qasim had demanded. Mullah Hussein and a few others determined to carry out their late teacher's dying wish to find the Promised One. He retired to a mosque for 40 days of prayer. Sayyid Qasim had told Mullah Hussein that he would know the Promised One when he delivered, without being asked to do so, a commentary on a chapter of the Quran known as the Surah of Joseph. As if by a magnet, Mullah Hussein says, he is attracted to the city of Shiraz. And there, in Shiraz, something happened that would reverberate across the world. Absolutely beautiful. As we were discussing in the beginning of the interview, we mentioned that you also done some philanthropy and that philanthropy is a big part of the work that you do. Um, so would you like to share with us a little bit about some of the projects that you've worked on? Um, one that I specifically can think of that would be really uh, great if you could share a little bit more with us about it um, is the work that you did in ACO um, a few years ago. So uh, it was in 2014, I was asked to go to ACO. I um, had called up a man by the name of Bill Strickland and said, I want to build a center in Chicago, which we ended up building called Shycat. And about five conversations in, he says, well, I want to build this center um, for Jews and Arabs. I'm talking to Jewish philanthropists in Miami, and we want to build a center for Jews and Arabs in Akko, Israel. And I couldn't believe he'd said Akko because um, actually 
and I'll change my background real quick. In Akko, Israel, this is the point of adoration for all Baha'is, and this is where Baha'u'llah is buried. So here was Bill, who's not a Baha'i, asking me to go to the holiest Baha'i place in the world. And I had decided to become a Baha'i at that point, but I hadn't yet. The center is now in Akko. It's doing very well, and it's making peace. It's doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's great to see that work being done to really help bring our world together slowly. So what does success mean to you? And how has your definition of success evolved throughout your life and career? Success to me means is really spiritual success today. When I was younger, it was, it was material success. I wanted to be rich, you know, famous, like a lot of young people want to do. I mean, I did that. I mean, I, I kind of like overshot the mark, uh, <laughs> but to me, money only has value if you use it for good. And I always tell people, worry about your spirit. The material will come, you know, work hard, try to, you know, obviously you want to try to make money and, and make a living. Beyond that, you don't have to be the wealthiest person in the world. Um, you don't have to be wealthy to make a difference. Um, spiritual wealth is the only, the only thing that matters. You know, another way to look at it is when you leave this world, and we all are going to leave this world, you don't get to take your money with you. But you do get to take your kindness and your love and your compassion and your mercy and all the spiritual virtues. Those are the true wealth. And that's the, what you get to keep for eternity. Beautiful advice. So with that spirit, what considerations do you feel are over or undervalued in society when evaluating in careers in business and film? You know, wealth and fame are overvalued. It shouldn't be your, your primary aspiration and it shouldn't be your only definition of success. So I, I think that's, I think we're a very materialistic society. You know, one thing I, I, I'm very fond of saying is that we have all the material wealth we need. It's just not distributed correctly. And were we spiritually wealthy, we would distribute it correctly. We need to be spiritually wealthy. The world needs that. In film, if you see like a lot of the films in TV, um, they're not, the message of the film is undervalued. So the people making the films are not really caring. Like you'll see a bunch of films where there's gratuitous violence. So when you're talking about greed and lust and envy and hate, these are the things that are lower values. And it's very easy to go for the lowest common denominator, especially when you're making uh, media, when you're making movies and TV, because people are, are fascinated by it. But you know, if you really think about the best films of all time and the films that have actually done the best, they're about spiritual values. Those are the types of films that I want to make. It's a harder film to make. Yes, exactly. Now looking more at youth specifically and their place in society, what do you think is the role of youth in today's society? And why do you think it's important for them to engage in service? Um, youth are undervalued in terms of their service in society. And in our society, we say, oh, well, you know, you'll be an adult someday. And when you're an adult, you can make a difference. When you're young, you have all this energy, you have all your, your brains working full speed, you have these new ideas, you have so much to share with the world. And it's, you know, you shouldn't waste your youth. You, know, you should be spending your youth solving the problems of the world. The youth have so much to add and, and really just try to, you know, again, I think it's never too early. You know, just this idea of service. I mean, they've done tests on this, they did um, a study and they found that, that kids your age, actually college, just a little older than you, who were told to go out and have a good time actually got less happy when they remeasured their happiness. And when they were told to do service, got happier. When, when youth come together, no matter what our background is, and we go in with the United Mission, we can really make that difference that we want to see. With everything that we talked about, what advice do you have for those who would like to pursue a career in business, entrepreneurship, and or film? Being an entrepreneur is a wonderful career for those who have uh, the stomach for it. It's risky. It's sometimes nerve wracking. It can be stressful. It's, it requires a lot of hard work. Um, you have to uh, be very frugal, hopefully at first, because you probably won't have a lot of money when you're starting your business. Um, you have to be able to be very flexible, very creative. Um, did I mention hardworking? I should probably mention that twice because entrepreneurs tend to work long hours, especially at first. But if you can do that, and if that's what you want to do, it's a, it's a great career. Um, filmmaking is a great career. It's also very difficult. But follow your heart, follow your passion. Always, always, always try to leave every person you meet with more than they expected. I love employees like that. And I can tell you that 
other employers do as well. No matter what little task it is, and, and, and let nothing be below you, especially if you're an entrepreneur, but let nothing be, no task be below you. You know, we're all equal in this world. Wonderful advice. And before our episode ends, do you have any additional words of encouragement or advice for our audience? Yeah, the last piece of advice is that we all have a spirit and that spirit needs to be fed. If you don't move to the higher, if you don't feed your spirit with the higher virtues, then you're going to find the low ones. And you'll be much happier if you're in the higher plane. A lot to think about and keep in mind as we all go towards pursuing our careers and for our personal lives. So thank you very much, Mr. Sarowitz, for your insight and advice today. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. And to learn more about Mr. Sarowitz and to check out his work, visit his Facebook at steve.sarowitz. Also be sure to check out Spring Green Films at https colon slash slash www.springgreenfilms.com and Wayfair Studios at https colon slash slash www.wayfairstudios.com to learn more about the movies we discussed in this interview, the other movies they have created, and to keep up with upcoming movies, projects, and announcements from them. Mr. Sherwitz and his team at Spring Green Films have published the full documentary, The Gate, Dawn of the Baha'i Faith, on YouTube and Amazon for free. So be sure to watch, and the links will be in the description of this episode. In addition, Disney released Mr. Sherwitz and his partner Justin Baldoni's film, Clouds, on October 16th of 2020. You can find it on Disney Plus and download Zach's song, which hit number one on iTunes again as of the release of the movie on all music streaming services. Mr. Sherowitz and his team have also been working on a number of exciting and new upcoming projects, including a TV show about the Chicago Defender and a film about astronaut Ronald McNair. Would you like to share more about these projects with us? The Chicago Defender is the one I'm probably most excited about because it, what, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look. For those of you who don't know, the Chicago Defender was the biggest black newspaper. It's the, the most widely circulated for about 100 years. Its founder was Robert Abbott, who was a Baha'i. And what really makes me excited about this project is it's a chance to take American history through black eyes. Plus the Defender was all about justice. And I love the idea. Um, so I'm really excited about that. I'm excited about uh, the film about Ron McNair, who's an amazing astronaut. He had a PhD in physics from MIT. He was a brilliant man. He was also a black belt in karate. He was a musician. He was like a Renaissance man. And uh, he came from nothing. And so it's, you know, and he was a man of faith as well. How exciting. So be sure to check those out. Thank you again for your time today, Mr. Sherowitz. And as always, thank you all for listening. Be sure to subscribe, follow, and like the podcast on its various platforms, including YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts to be notified each time a new episode is posted. If you want to get the latest updates about the show, announcements, submit questions that you would like me to consider to talk about on the show, or join discussions related to the topics we discuss on the show, follow us on Instagram at spiritof.success, Facebook at spiritof.success9, and our new Facebook group under the Spirit of Success. Until next time, I'm your host, Yara, and don't forget to continue challenging yourself and working to make your spirit soar to new heights. Bye!